Hello and welcome to New Scientist TV. This month we investigate some deformed frogs. We also meet a baby robot that's just finding its feet. But first we head to the UK's Silverstone Racetrack, where a team is gearing up to compete for millions of dollars. Sean O'Neill tells us more. I'm here at Delta Motorsport to take a look at a prototype all-electric vehicle that hopes to take an X-Prize by storm. Let's have a look around. Here in their workshop, Nick Carpenter and his team are completing the assembly of their E4 Coupe. It will soon be shipped to the United States for a shakedown round of testing. We think we've got some, some pretty tough competition out there, um, but we, we believe the approach we've taken is, is fundamentally the right one, which is really to start from a clean sheet of paper, right from the ground up. The goal of the competition is to create an energy efficient vehicle that people will want to buy. To qualify, a car must have an efficiency of at least 100 miles per gallon or the energy equivalent. In this car, all the energy is coming from its batteries. The biggest challenge, I think, was beginning to understand the technologies, how you can minimise the quantity of energy that you're using over any given journey, uh, because with a battery electric vehicle, the biggest issue you have is energy storage. The quantity of energy stored in a, in a battery pack is, is so much smaller than in even a litre of gasoline. Carpenter chose to use three lithium-ion phosphate batteries like this one, but he also needed a super-efficient motor. There were various options that we looked at, um, but all of them were, were a compromise in one way or another. Right. So we got together with a group of guys um, in at Oxford University, um, which has taken us to where we are today, which is a, a bespoke motor for, for our vehicle. With four of these motors, the car should be able to reach speeds of over 150 miles per hour. But its performance is also aided by its lightweight carbon structure. And that obviously is one of the key elements from our perspective in making the car as efficient as we can because every time you accelerate you're using energy in accelerating the car. So the more you can minimise the weight the more energy you save. On a typical drive cycle the car will be able to achieve 80 to 90 percent efficiency but to win millions at the final event it will all be down to performance. At the moment that speed event isn't actually defined, right? Um, so we don't know, it may be more about handling than speed, but we hope that what we've done with the car in terms of low centre of gravity, four-wheel drive, uh, lots of torque at the wheels, we should be able to cope with pretty much anything they throw at us. Next we find out how an artist, inspired by abnormal frogs, solved a scientific mystery. James Urquhart takes up the story. Here in London, a new exhibit features striking images of deformed frogs. It's the work of Brandon Ballengy, an artist inspired by the declining numbers of amphibians. He collects tiny developing animals to produce these prints. Their skin and tissue are extracted before he injects them with dyes and scans them at ultra-high resolution. They're kind of posed in different ways or laid out and I just kind of do that based on the morphology and how I think it will make a, a beautiful photograph. It really has this tremendous amount of detail that really far surpasses uh, film. But Balangi isn't only an artist. After talking to biologists about deformed frogs, he was inspired to become a researcher. It was thought initially that these deformities were caused by chemical pollution and Really, it needed to be well-researched. This was really intriguing to me. In some parts of North America, extra limbs in frogs have been linked to parasites. They burrow into the tadpole's limb buds and damage tissue, causing duplicate limbs to develop. Ballengy wanted to see if this was also happening to frogs in the UK. We found a site in Yorkshire that did have um, little tiny metamorphic toads that were metamorphosing right at the point we were there with loads of deformities. I started it with the assumption that chemicals were somehow involved. So I took water from the sites and tested it with healthy tadpoles. All the, the experiments yielded negative results. Balangi then looked for parasites, but this didn't seem to be the cause either. Instead, he found that it was down to tiny dragonflies that were biting the tadpoles developing limbs. They like the developing limb buds. We don't know why yet. Why are they doing that? Uh, we're not sure if there's maybe more nutrients or if maybe the limb buds are just the little legs are a little easier for them to grasp hold of and catch on to. Um, but they sure seem to do it consistently. And this was important not only because it established these predators as a potential cause, proximate cause for deformities, but it 
also show just how durable the tadpoles themselves are and how they heal from incredible injuries. Now Balangi plans to study frogs in different sites around the world. He hopes his research will keep fueling his art and get people to contemplate the plight of amphibians. Finally, we take a look at a robot that's about to become a bit more like a human toddler. Sandrine Kerstemont tells us more. Here in London, this robot on display will soon be getting an extreme makeover. iCub is a robot being modelled after a two-year-old child, but its hands are currently the size of an eight-year-old's. We redesigned the hand and we now have a hand which is the size of an 18-month-old child. Uh, so it's very tiny. It's got um, 22 degrees of freedom. So it's got almost all the motions you have in the human hand. According to the team, it's the smallest hand in the world with such dexterity. It will be equipped with sensors to help it pick up objects. But the robot will also soon have a new, more springy set of legs. Impacts are really nasty um, with the traditional design because of the way you have them with the gearbox and the motor. If you take a heavy impact, you'll actually probably destroy the robot. With the, the new version, what we have at the minute is with the springs, um, which are built into the system, we can absorb energy. The new legs should help iCub withstand falls and interact with humans in a safer way. But in addition to new limbs, another team is upgrading its brain. Traditionally in robotic learning we tend to use lots of training data which is very time consuming and requires lots of demonstrations. So instead at Imperial College we're uh, trying to learn with one shot learning which means you just need one demonstration um, and perhaps your learning might not be as precise but it'll be something that you can use to generalise later. iCub successfully used this approach to play a game of tic-tac-toe it learned to draw a circle using its camera. Then it replicated the drawing elsewhere on the grid, as well as on a different board altogether. But soon it could learn to do more complex tasks. Tic-tac-toe is quite a small problem. Um, maybe when we've got some more feedback on the, the robot, they're developing uh, tactile sensors and things, so perhaps grasping objects and uh, learning how to pass objects, interactions with people. With time, iCub should become more and more human-like. The team also hopes to cover its metallic skeleton with a soft structure that mimics skin. That's all for now, but don't forget to visit our website for some more amazing science videos. You can see how market researchers plan to tap into the brains of customers, or watch an octopus get tricked by some high-definition video footage. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.